Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Uh, we have a lot to be thankful for. Amen? Yeah. I hope you had a, a great Thanksgiving holiday. Um, you know, preaching for Thanksgiving is kind of an interesting situation. I thought about uh, what, what to do. Oh, it's, it's the Grateful Samaritan. There was a, a play on the Good Samaritan. I'm, I'm sorry, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, preaching on uh, Thanksgiving, you know, what to, what to do. I feel like there's a really easy sermon that's kind of laid out in front of you to talk about all the things we have to be thankful for, all the things that the Bible says about giving thanks. Uh, we can talk about the physical and psychological benefits of having a grateful spirit and things like that. But uh, I don't know. I, I, don't, I didn't really want to preach that kind of sermon. Uh, for one, because I, if, if you've heard me preach before, I, I tend not to preach topically. Uh, you know what I mean by that. Just sort of piecing things together of, of uh, some some thing that I want to preach about, and then I go and find where the Bible talks about that. See, because I, for me, when that happens, uh, I, I feel like that's that's not what the worship hour is for, right? That uh, you didn't come here to hear what I have to say about a given subject, but we come together and we read the gospel and we meditate on Scripture in the hopes that somehow. In doing this, we might hear a word from God. So this morning, we think of the parable or the story of the ten lepers, not because this is maybe the most informative or interesting or even the most inspirational, uh, but that as we hear and meditate on the words of this gospel, that God is present to us in some kind of unique way through the reading and preaching of his word. See, even when we are at our furthest from God, God's word reaches out to us. And that's where the story begins this morning. Jesus, the very word of God, is reaching out to the extremities, to the outer limits. The Bible says on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, the capital city, the home of the temple, the place where God dwells. Jesus is on his way to the center, but you see he begins here on the periphery. He's between Samaria and Galilee. Now Samaria and Galilee both were known as places of compromised values, of impurity. The Samaritans, as I'm sure you all know, were known as sort of half-Jews. They had apostatized, intermarried with Gentiles, abandoned traditional worship. And the Galileans, by reputation, weren't that much better. Galilee had come to be known as Galilee of the Gentiles. It was a place for outsiders and outcasts. If Jerusalem represents holiness, then Samaria and Galilee represent hypocrisy. They aren't just pagans. They're people who should know better but they've failed anyways, and it's to these people that Jesus goes out to visit. And the Bible goes on to say, as he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Now, any self-respecting Jewish man from Jerusalem would have had no dealings with these Samaritans and Galileans, but now we encounter ten people who not even the Samaritans and Galileans will interact with. That is these lepers. These ten lepers are the outcasts of the outcasts. You see the point here? That being in Samaria and Galilee is already being on the margins of society. And now Jesus finds himself confronting the people on the margins of the margins. These lepers were quarantined, excommunicated, shunned. For fear of contracting the disease themselves, the village forced the lepers to live separate from the rest of the community. You see, so if Jerusalem represents holiness, that's where Jesus is going, and Samaria represents hypocrisy, then these Samaritan and Galilean lepers represent those who are furthest from God. 
And I bring this up on a day like today because, as we noted at the beginning, on a holiday weekend, a day like today, I'm sure that there are some of us that are in this very position. Some of us who came back to church today, perhaps with family, and perhaps this is the first time we've been in church in ages, and we know in our hearts that we are the furthest from holiness that we've ever been. The church has cast us out. Even family has cast us out. Even our closest friends, we've become outcasts of outcasts. The Bible says that as Jesus passed through town, they kept their distance. And I know we do the same thing. I think that's why the seats in the balcony and the seats in the back row are the most popular. Because we like to keep our distance. And if you remember about a year ago, we closed the balcony for one week. It was going to be for a month we were going to close the balcony. We closed the balcony for one week and there was panic. And why is that? Because we like to keep our distance. And I know this because I've done it too, but the further away we sit, we feel maybe less visible. We feel maybe closer to an escape. We feel less confined. We feel a little bit safer if we can just slip in and slip out. But I'll tell you, the church is not a place for keeping your distance. It's a space for reverence, yes, but the church, more than anywhere else, should feel like home. The great picture of the Bible that it paints of God is not a God who keeps his distance. Here we see Jesus in Samaria and Galilee among the lepers, and as the Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And so as Jesus uh, draws near to these lepers, they call out saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. If you've ever wondered what it means to draw near to God, this is it. If you've ever felt like praying but you didn't know how, this is it. Throughout the Gospels, this same prayer you may have noticed is echoed again and again from those who are blind, those who are sick, those who are in need. They call out to Christ, and it's always with more or less this, these same words. Have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Sometimes I think we fail to pray because uh, we can't find the words. We don't know what we should say, or we don't have the spiritual energy to say it. Have you felt that way before? You feel like praying, but you don't even know how or where to begin. This is where to begin, with just those simple words, Lord, have mercy. So when Jesus saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And this is often how Jesus enacts his healings, and we cannot miss the significance of this. I hope this, the point of this is not lost on you. Jesus says, go your, show yourselves to the priests. Why the priest? It's the responsibility of the priest to inspect someone who has already been cured of leprosy to see if the disease is really gone. So when Jesus tells these lepers, go show yourselves to the priests, He's telling them, go and do what you would do if you had already been healed. And this is the opposite of our mindset most of the time, isn't it? Where we say to ourselves, oh, when I get my act together, then I'll start going to church. When I get cleaned up, then I'll come back to God. I'll start praying more once I'm a better person. But Jesus' point is just the opposite of that. Even though these lepers were covered in sores, Jesus says, go show yourselves to the priests. Let them see how clean you are. Now, common sense would have told these lepers that they would first need to actually be clean. But Jesus says, just go. Step out in faith. Even though you look down at your own body and you see arms and legs covered in sores, 
Just start living today as if you were clean, and you will be. And the Bible says that as they went, they were made clean. In the act of faith, they were healed. They were made clean because they started living as if they were clean. Even if they looked down at their own bodies and saw their own disease, and you may look, look at your own life and see your own inadequacies, but the words of Jesus are to go and have faith and that you will be healed, even if you don't see it in yourself. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. So now finally we come to this theme of thankfulness. Only one of the ten lepers, upon having been healed, returns to give thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Here the author is trying to remind us or trying to show us that this person would have been the most likely to have been looked down upon by the others. He was the one who represents the most extreme case. You see, I'm reminded of the story of the woman who comes into Jesus while he's eating at the table and pours precious ointment on his feet. And the men who are sitting there are, are, are scandalized by this, by this spectacle. What is it that this woman is doing? But Jesus reminds them that her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Our thankfulness, Jesus is saying, is in proportion to the situation that we've been rescued from. You know, Jesus tells a story in that same context. Imagine you have a friend who owes you $5 and a friend who owes you $500. And you cancel both of their debts. Who's going to be more grateful but the one who had the larger debt? So here comes this Samaritan leper who returns to give thanks. But we realize, I think, something important about what's going on here. Because all ten of these lepers had the same disease. All ten were excommunicated. All ten were facing death. The one who was the most thankful was not necessarily the one who was worse off, but the one who recognized the severity of his condition. He recognized how bad off he was. So Jesus asks, were not ten made clean, but the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And now here is what I think is the point what we can see through this story is that thankfulness ultimately comes from a place of humility. You see the relationship there? You see, we should all be overwhelmed by God's mercy. We should all be bursting at the doors to come and give thanks and praise to God, give Him the worship that is due. But I think we lack that attitude of thanksgiving because of our pride. We don't see the lowness of the condition that God has truly saved us from. So of these ten lepers, it was the one, it was the Samaritan who realized just to the limits that God had gone to save him. So what is it that stops us from being thankful? It's our own pride, our own sense of self-sufficiency. We are unaware of our total dependence on God. We take the blessings of life and freedom and mercy and worship. We take them for granted. And meanwhile, it is those Samaritans among us, those of us who, by the looks of it, may be furthest from God, they are the ones who give God right praise. They may be fearful to come to church. They may feel unworthy to be here. They may feel unacceptable. But the point of the gospel is that it is to these types of people that God is 
eager to listen when we cry out in the simple prayer, Lord, have mercy. God is quick to hear them. Jesus tells the story of two men who went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a day. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. So Jesus says to this grateful Samaritan, get up. Go on your way. Your faith has made you well. And I notice, I think, a kind of terseness, a kind of shortness in Jesus' response here. He just says, get up, go on your way. You see, Jesus doesn't continue to lavish praise on this man. Most importantly, this one man who comes back to give thanks doesn't receive any kind of extra special blessing because he returned. He goes home healed, the same as the other nine. Jesus uh, is not so offended that he wants to revoke his blessing on the nine who didn't give thanks. I wish I hadn't have healed them because of their lack of gratitude. He simply tells this one, get up and go about your life. And so we humble ourselves before God. We thank him for his blessings not because there are some physical or psychological benefits to being a grateful person, not because it, it will win us some favor from God. We do it simply because it is right. We lift up our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. We give thanks to the Lord our God because it is right and just. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give thanks to our Father, creator of the world and source of all life. Amen.